Good afternoon. I'm Andy Van Cloonan, CEO of National Skills Coalition, and I'm so glad you were able to join us today for our next fireside chat with our featured guest, John Ferner, who's the president and CEO of Walmart US. As you know, we talk a lot here at NSC about the challenges and opportunities facing both workers and businesses in this time of economic upheaval and accelerating technological change in the workplace. These are huge shifts that are gonna require new ways of thinking about how we invest in the ongoing upskilling of workers across our economy. It's gonna require new efforts both in the private sector from international corporations down to small businesses. And it's gonna require a sea change in public policy as well as we think about new nationwide investments in the skills of people trying to find new jobs as well as those who are trying to advance into better paying jobs and in industries that are being transformed by these technologies. So we want to talk today with one of the biggest employers in the country, Walmart, about how they are investing in their workers to deal with these shifts. And then we'll turn to hear some thoughts from some local business leaders about their parallel challenges and what they think public policy could be doing to help them respond to these challenges as well. But to start, let me start talking with, to John Ferner. John grew up in Walmart stores, starting as an associate stocking shelves in 1993. He eventually worked his way up to become head of Sam's Club, and then eventually assumed the mantle of, of president and CEO of Walmart US. Then we're going to get some reflections from those local business leaders about what they think they could be doing and how what Walmart has been attempting to do is something that they would like to do in their own companies with the support of better public policies. Uh, I should also mention that today's Fireside Chat is co-sponsored by NSC's affiliate, Business Leaders United, and we thank them for their partnership in this conversation today. But now, let me welcome John Ferner, President and CEO of Walmart US. John, welcome. Well, thanks, Andy. Great to be here. Um, you know, I just want to start by saying we're grateful to, to NSC and to you for all the work we've done together over the years. It means a lot, and it's it's great to get some time with you and, and to talk about all the things that, that the team here are doing all across the country. Really exciting. Yeah, exciting for me, too. And I, so because I know, you know there's a set of issues that we here at National Skills Coalition hold really important, and I know that it's an important part of your leadership there at Walmart, which is kind of dealing with how rapidly industries are changing these days and what we can be doing both in the private sector and in the public sector to make sure working folks get a chance to upskill and stay ahead of that curve. And so I wanted to start our conversation talking very specifically about what you've seen in the retail sector. Now, you've been working in it for at least 30 years. Um, you know, you started as a Walmart associate uh, and then, you know, through your leadership at Sam's Club and the innovations that you tested there and now things that you're deploying across thousands of Walmart stores across the country. Um, I'm just really curious, like, if you look at the job of a Walmart associate today, mm -hmm. how's it different than the job that you were doing when you were stocking shelves back in 1993? It, it's, it's, it's so interesting. And in, in some ways, some things haven't changed that much. In other ways, they have changed so dramatically. And it feels like the last four to five years, the pace of change has, has continued to not only occur, but accelerate in many ways. And I was thinking about this as I was I was preparing for our conversation. And I remember when I started in a Walmart store just across the street, probably quarter of a mile from where I'm sitting today, I would I would come in at five in the morning and, and it was really exciting. I would I would figure out where all the inventory was and make sure that product was available for customers. But I was doing it with a pen and a paper and a lot of running really fast and looking around. And in today our associates come in and and they're armed with a device in their hand that we've issued to them. That's all happened in the last couple of years. They clock in on their device. So think about in a big super center, it's a, a building that in some cases over four acres in size. And, and so the time they can save just by clocking in on their device. They have all the tools that they need on their device. The information is right there in front of them. And so it, it, you really think about the difference in what I was doing back in 1993 to now, we have, we've we've created the opportunity where people can upskill on the job and be involved in, in the modern economy in a different way. And you know, retail is such an important industry. It's, it's the largest employment sector in the country. And I kind of break things down in threes a lot of times. And, you know, people come to retail a lot of times for their first job. They want to get a first start. They want to do something for a while until they figure out what they want a career, their career to be. So people may start in retail and become 
a teacher, they may go work to be in public service as a fireman, they may do other things. And there are other people who come to us later in career. So we've got great stories of people that started in the military in the last uh, decade or so, we've hired about 300,000 veterans. So people can, can start there, then they bring their leadership skills to us. Then there are others like me who start their career looking for their career and end up having their entire career in retail. So it's a really interesting industry. And, and there's just so much that we've been able to do in the last really four to five years with technology that has really changed the way people work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this point you make about careers, I mean, this idea that a career is a straight line, rarely, right? For most folks, it's not that. And, and to your point, a lot of the folks that are working at Walmart are coming at it at various points in their working life and kind of trying to figure out like, all right, what is it that we can do to help this person succeed here in our company, but recognizing that they worked somewhere else before they came here and they may be working in a completely different industry somewhere down the road. So also kind of thinking for them, you know, long term, what all that what all that means. And, and I'd love to talk a little bit more about that. But since you mentioned these devices, I'm really mm -hmm. curious to hear a little bit more about like what that technology is uh, that you've helped you've helped deploy. It sounds like, you know, over almost a three quarters of a million associates now have this device in their hand that they're using for various different things. What was the thinking behind putting that technology in the hands of associates? And was there anything that Walmart needed to do to make sure that folks had the skills to actually make the best use of it? Well, that's a great question. So, so start go back to the start of the story. In, in 1993, we had handheld devices that you, you could use for certain applications in the store, but there were only, and I'll get the numbers wrong, there might've been 10 per store. So think an environment where there are 350, 400 people, and there may be 10 of these or 20. Mm -hmm. So if you found one, it was like finding gold. I mean, it was, you were so lucky to get your hands on one. <laughs> And we were competing over them. I remember doing a remodel one time. And, and when we were taking counters down, we would lift up the base plates, the bottom shelf of the of the of the racks, and we would find these things sitting there where someone had hidden it. So <laughs> you know, you just hold on to them. And I, I remember spending so much time either looking for a handheld or going back to a terminal, and in some cases waiting in line to get to a terminal to get some sort of information or print something or create some finish some process that was really important to what I was doing. And you know, people value time so much more, more, more importantly now than what we would have even 20 years ago or 10 years ago. And so with time being such a precious commodity, we don't wanna have associates in a situation where they're frustrated because they don't have the tools they need. They're not being challenged. They don't have a variety of work. They're not learning every day. And they don't have a sense of closure where they can go home every day and feel like they accomplished something. So you know, there was this point where you, you don't want people to be frustrated because they're taking time trying to help and they're not able to because they don't have the tools. And so the decision, um, it actually wasn't all that hard. And we, we made the decision a couple of years ago. Uh, we ended up working with Samsung to get basically a small, um, it, basically it's a cell phone um, that has everything that associates need on it. And then your question about making sure people have the skills to use it. Some of the things our, our team have, have been working on is, is, you know, number one, making sure that they have the tools to locate inventory, keep inventory in stock, do price changes, help with customer service, locate all the things you'd expect. The second thing is we built into every application listening. So when an associate uses an application for the first time, they can provide feedback about what works well, what doesn't work well. Um, third, we created a, an application a few years ago called Ask Sam. So our founder, Sam Walton, we just named it Ask Sam. And you can ask this application anything. And in fact, we get almost a couple million questions a week now. People say, where is this? Do I have more of this coming? How do I do this certain task? How does this process work? And so we, we listen institutionally. We have a million and a half people all over the country serving customers every week. And that's our way of being able to listen to anyone who has feedback on something they need, something they want or what they want to do. And then we take the feedback and then we work with our teams to make sure that our products that we deliver in the device are usable, they're friendly, they're accessible, and they're exactly what our people need. So I, I'd like to think of it like we have a million and a half inventors out there every week who are giving us feedback on how we should be creating their future. And so their, their feedback creates a roadmap for our tech teams and our product teams to develop what we're going to do for them. So it's, it's really quite collaborative. And you know, I, I bet a lot of them don't even realize that how much of their feedback we're actually using to create. Mm -hmm. The work of the future, but I just see so many, so many ways that the work is changing. People are upskilling. People are having the opportunity to have technology in their hand versus what I was doing, which was running around with my, over it. Yeah. yeah, looking, yeah, <laughs> begging. Please, can I just borrow that? Can you get a battery to work? Um, but it's just so important that the whole system of work 
is designed where people can have a great day, they can be productive, and they can learn something every day. I think, you know, many of us that are just so curious, I'm a really curious person, I just enjoy learning new things every day. And I, I know a lot of our team do as well. So um, this, this two way system of listening is really important. Yeah, so let's talk about uh, that idea of taking feedback from the folks on the floor, thinking about what the training is that, that would help them succeed there in the store um, in various different roles, right? Uh, but, and also, I, I guess, because I have seen a fair amount of the work that Walmart has done to try to invest in the skills of folks so they can succeed in their current roles. But the company has also started thinking about like, how is it that we can invest in the talent and careers of folks whether they're going to pursue that in retail or maybe they might be going to a completely different industry or occupation, even things like the building trades. And so this idea of a tuition assistance program, you've called it Live Better You. Um, talk to me a little bit about that. And why would Walmart want to invest in skills for somebody to work in something other than retail? Well, um, a couple of reasons. But let, me, let me start with retail just a second, and then I want to bridge over to the second, the second part of the answer. Retail is a lot more than I think most people probably think on the outside just looking in. So the surface may look like the only thing we have in terms of employment is what an associate would do in a store, which is where I started. I started working in a garden center part time and, and I loved it. But on, on our team, we have we have doctors, we have pharmacy techs, we have pharmacists, we have engineers, we have doctors, we have a healthcare team, we have paralegals, we have and I'm going to forget a bunch. We have, you know, we have logisticians. We have uh, a team called Mobius that a group of PhDs in mathematics that solve all the problems with supply chain fluidity every each and every day. So there's not there there aren't too many industries that you could think of that you actually cannot do at Walmart, and that's been the appeal um, for so many of us for so long. And and I've been here as you said almost 30 years. It'll be 30 years next year, and probably had 20 jobs. And it's been a wide range of things that are all tied together because it's all Walmart and it's within the retail industry, but they've all been quite different. So, you know, first, why offer so many opportunities for learning in such a broad range, range of topics is, is that the easiest answer is many of those people will find that opportunity inside the company. Mm -hmm. The second part, though, is we're local in over 5,000 communities between Walmart stores, Walmart fulfillment centers, distribution centers, and Sam's Clubs. We are local in over 5,000 communities. And so, giving people the opportunity to learn to strengthen their own skill set to move into a professional trade or to move into something in in community or civic service or a professional service in a community also helps strengthen uh, all the communities around and and lastly i just say it's not uncommon that i'm i'm out in a store or in a fulfillment center or somewhere in the market and you see somebody with a 10 or 15 year badge and you ask them where did you start and what did you do and and they'll say, well, actually, I started at Walmart when I was a teenager. I, I ran off for a few years for a, a vacation, another career, or I went to school, or I went and got a trade, and then I came back. And, and so, you know, I think this investment in communities and the country and people, regardless if it's all for our benefit or not, I think in the long term, it's great for, it's great for the business, it's great for the community, it's great for the country. Yeah, that, that idea that um... – Folks might work for you and leave and come back and the idea that they know that you invested in them back then and so that they value the potential of coming back and working for you in a different role, I think is really, really powerful. And I think it's a lesson there for a lot of other companies as well. Certainly not as many companies that are as big as Walmart, but even for smaller companies, there's a way that there can be different roles that folks can play if you give them a chance to kind of develop their careers in, in, in different aspects. But I do want to focus on one part here because I don't want it to be lost. So, you know, the private sector spends a lot on training and tuition assistance and, and things like that. Um, folks sometimes don't recognize it. it spends much more than we spend in the public sector. However, companies tend to focus on middle and upper management, folks who already have a college degree. That's where a lot of that investment is. This approach that you've taken is really focused on associates, right? Live Better You is was set up specifically for associates at Walmart. Um, and I guess just to talk a little bit about that, like the idea of where making that investment for your frontline workers, um, which is really kind of stepping out from what the private sector has done in the past. I'm curious, like what the thinking was behind that, what the reaction has been from other folks in the corporate community on some of those issues. Well, the, the important data point to, to consider is 75% of our managers started as hourly associates somewhere in a, in a facility in the U.S. And I'm one of those. Um, I was in college and 
I was working my way through school and I decided to, to get my degree and I became an intern and then that worked out. But 75% of our managers all start as hourlies and, and a, a, a large number of those end up getting those positions without a four-year degree. There are a lot of ways to get there, and whether it's the right on-the-job skill training, um, a lot of people that that really work through all sorts of challenges, a lot that came from the military. Um, mm-hmm. I mentioned that earlier, um, but certainly we see a lot of the skills that people learn in military service in terms of leading teams become a, a skill that's very applicable to leading a team of three to 400 people inside a store, or in some cases, thousands of people in fulfillment centers. Um, pretty common to see. And we also know that the way people want to work is going to change. And and I, I get the, this question all the time, what's the new normal? And I actually have no idea. And I don't, I don't say that because I'm trying to avoid the question. Um, I think change is inevitable. I think change is going to be persistent. And for the most part, um, whether it's serving a customer or ser- serving an associate, whoever does it better than the people that do it out there today will end up being the winner. And so... You know, innovation is always going to happen. I, I just think of it as progress. Mm-hmm. And this idea of investing in in the workforce, short term, medium term, long term, whether it's for your benefit or it's or maybe for your benefit later, you know, us us finding ways as a, in the company to put back and to give back into local communities is is something that's been really important to the company. Yeah, I can see it all the way back to quotes from uh, Sam and Helm Walton back in the '70s and '80s. And it's a different scale than it is today. What what we were able to do and and stores and communities 50 years ago when we were a really small company is way different than what it is today. When I started, there wasn't, there was, there weren't the resources you know, they, they didn't exist to be able to provide something like live better you. So as we've gotten bigger and as we've scaled, we've been able to do more that help our team. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this idea about kind of focusing on what are the skills that folks have? What are the skills that we can invest in? How can it prepare them for advancement? Um, I know you're familiar with this and it's, kind of become something of a buzzword in Washington circles this, these days, this, this topic of skills-based hiring. So thinking about how it is that we think about hiring and advancement different than what we've done traditionally. And just to catch folks up, this the idea of skills-based hiring is rather than just relying on a traditional college degree as kind of the marker of what might qualify somebody for a job or not. And therefore, obviously ruling out a lot of folks who actually have great skills and great work experience, but may not have gotten, may not have gone to college for four years. Like, what is it that we can do to look at the skills that folks have and the experiences they have? And how does that match up to the specific requirements of a job? And why not give them a chance to develop those skills for that particular job? And this is how now we're talking about changing how we think about higher ed policy, how we think about, you know, private sector practice in terms of hiring and advancement. And as you just said, you know, Walmart has has, has uh, walked this talk, right? You said you, you are advancing a lot of folks within the company who don't have college degrees. Um, but I'm kind of curious, like this concept of skills-based hiring, do you think that this is something that is going to be the future for corporate America? Or where do you think, it, at least where does it work for Walmart? And where is it that we could kind of get that conversation going more broadly? Well, as, as things change. And as I said a minute ago, my opinion, my belief is they will continue to change and work will evolve. Then you kind of have to look at it two ways. Do do you want to go find a completely new workforce that has the skills for what the work is becoming? Or do you want to bring people along with you? And I think the answer is quite where you want to bring people along with you. Now, I'll tell you a quick story. I was in one of our distribution centers in Central Florida a couple months ago, and we have installed a, a pretty significant um, automation system in the in the distribution center. And so, when you look at the, the automation sit, uh, system, you know you ask questions like, "What does it do? It increases capacity. It takes some of the work that's extremely hard to do. We use machines to do some of that, and then people have evolved what their skills are." And I was talking to one of our associates there who had done a job there for about 20 years, one of the more physical jobs in the building, which is unloading unloading inbound trucks and moving it into storage systems. And, and today he's a bot tech, he's a robot tech. And, and he said, I won't get it exactly right, but his words were something like, I was doing the last job a bit over 20 years. I was thinking the next couple of years I would, I would retire and finish. But now that I've got this job, I see another 20 years of my future staying here. So he's, he's getting paid more, he's doing technical work. And there are so many people that all over the country in, in every industry, but in retail in particular and at Walmart, who just want to learn and and do more. So, you know, here's a guy who thought he would had done all the physical work he could do and wasn't sure how much longer he's staying. And now he's he's telling me he's got two decades of working in an automated environment 
and doing much better for himself and his family and really enjoying the work. So I think that's that's what we've got to do. Um, you know, I, I would never want to underestimate how smart our associates and our the customers are and and know that they have so much more potential if they just see that they have a path to being able to do it. And they, they, the training and development and the skills-based learning is there. And then having an employer who's, who's saying, you know, come along with us and we want to teach you new skills so that you will be more prepared for the future and you can live a better life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, we are 100% there with you on that, John. There are so many more people who want to learn who want to do something, who want to get paid more by getting by developing those skills. We just need to create the opportunities for them to do that. And the private sector has got a role for that. We think public policies have a role in that too. And particularly as we're working with the business community to figure some of those things out, it just opens up opportunity for so many more people than we've given a chance uh, in the past. And so uh, I really want to thank you for kind of putting a face on how that's working at Walmart. And I find that's going to be really useful as National Skills Coalition has these conversations with folks uh, around the country. So John, I really appreciate your joining me to have that conversation today. You bet, thanks Andy. Thanks for having me on and thanks for giving us a few minutes to talk about what we're doing here at Walmart. Thanks, appreciate it. All right, now let's turn to our panel to get some reflections on what we just heard from John. Uh, Joining me today are Bridget Gray. Bridget's the Chief Customer Officer for Opportunity at Work, a national organization that's working to ensure that people skilled through alternative routes can work, learn, and earn to their full potential. Hi, Bridget, how are you doing today? Hi, Andy, I'm great. Thank you for having me. Good to have you here. Uh, Next is Ryan Campbell. Ryan's a co-owner and director of strategy and operations for Chris's Caribbean Bistro near Atlanta, Georgia. Ryan, how are you? Great, Uh, thank you for having me, Andy. Excited to discuss these issues. Sure thing. And finally, Valerie Richardson. Val is the director of talent and workforce development for Prisma Healthcare. South Carolina's largest private nonprofit healthcare system. Val, thanks for joining us today. Good morning, and thank you so much for having me. For sure. Yeah, I should mention that Ryan and Valerie are both members of NSC's Business Leaders United Network, or BLU. Blue is a group of local business operators uh, who have been working not just to run their companies and their institutions, but also to bring these issues of workforce training and industry partnership to the attention of policymakers both in Washington, D.C. and in their states. And so I'm glad that they're going to bring some of that perspective to the conversation today as well. But let me first just turn generally to the panel just to see if there's any kind of initial reflections on what you heard uh, from John about Walmart's effort to invest in the skills of its frontline workforce. Um, Valerie, let me turn to you first and see any thoughts that you have about what you heard from John. Well, I think it's vitally important that your team members understand that there's opportunity for advancement regardless of where you start. Mm -hmm. Um, For folks like me who've been with the organization for 35 years, I'm certainly not in the same role where I began. And as we conduct our employee engagement survey each year, opportunities for career advancement is one of those top reasons why people want to remain with us. And so it's important that, you know, team members understand um, ways that they can focus or discover additional potential career pathways. We're able to help them to align um, funding sources, um, connect them with college partners to help them earn stackable credentials so that they can see themselves differently over the lifetime of their career and that there's opportunity for growth based on where they would like to be. Excellent points. Uh, Ryan, so obviously Walmart's a lot bigger company than what you're running there at your bistro. But I'm curious if there's anything that you heard from John that sounded at all familiar to some of the things that you're dealing with there. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, One of the things that he talked about was uh, how important time is, um, right? And kind of time ties into uh, productivity. It ties into efficiency. Um, And I'm kind of big on driving simplicity to drive all of those things, Mm -hmm. right? And so his you know, when he talks about how he utilizes technology and how like the mobility of things is really, really important um, and continuing into investing in the, in the workforce, not just technology wise, but opportunity wise um, and, you know, expanding that mobility that transfers over a lot to what we do here. Right. So when people don't feel overwhelmed, they're much more likely to stay. Right. If they're a lot more likely to stay, they're a lot more likely to believe in their abilities um, and that belief you know, kind of spurs a positive momentum forward. 
Um, and so I think that was one of the key takeaways, um, you know, from, from his segment that I think is directly transferable to what we do here at our restaurant. And this idea about how systems of technology can be good for workers, sometimes it can be disruptive for workers as well. And I think the idea about how it is that we're involving them and investing in them to make sure that it's seen as a positive, not as a, not as a negative, is really important, I'm sure, for how it is that you all think about how you run your companies and institutions. And we can, we'll talk some more about that. Bridget, let me turn to you. you know, opportunity at work, it's in your name there. I'm curious to know, based on some of the things that you were hearing from John, where that resonates with some of the work that you folks are doing. Yeah, it was interesting. I logged maybe three to four things that I heard John say that I thought was fantastic. So one of the things that really uh, impressed me was that 75% of their managers started as hourly associates. And so they put that investment in and they do upskilling in real time on the job. So it gives people an opportunity to Val's point, no matter where you start, there's upward mobility for you. So that was one thing that I logged. The other thing I logged was how important listening was to them in this uh, creation of a feedback loop so that employees at Walmart have the ability to, to help to determine how their future of work will look. And I love the fact that he talked about um, having one and a half in one 1.5 million inventors that are providing weekly feedback and how they should be creating their own future of work. One of the other things I logged too was that John is really getting ahead and from an innovation standpoint about how he's thinking about the future of work. And so he's not allowing things to get past him. He's actually leading the way from an innovative perspective and the understanding that work and how people want to work and engaging work is going to change. And I love the fact that he was thinking about that. So, you know, we focus on skills-based hiring and that is exactly what I heard him talking about. It's taking the skills that people have, helping to upskill them in real time and moving them through this process of upper mobility, regardless of having a four-year degree. I just thought that was fantastic. Yeah, excellent. And, and I do want to come back to talk a little bit more about this concept of skills-based hiring. But let me first go back to some of the things that we've talked about in the context of, Bridget, your comments on the future of work and digital skills and upskilling and technology and things like that. And Ryan, I want to come to you. You know, obviously, Walmart is a big company, uh, international company. It's making some huge investments in technology and then in the digital skills required for their workers to be able to take, take full use of that technology. But I'm curious this issue about technological change and digital upskilling. Um, this was something that you were a part of a conversation that we were having with the Biden administration last year as part of our, as part of our retail and hospitality industry recovery panel. And the kinds of things that we thought that uh, policymakers needed to know about how uh, the hospitality industry is changing very rapidly and where technology is impacting that. I'm curious about you know, how you, what things you think policymakers need to know about what's going on in your industry and what we're, where we need to be investing in workers' digital skills to kind of keep them ahead of that curve. Yeah, so it's, uh, I, I think for one, it's the pace, right? The agility at which uh, a lot of these changes are coming down. Um, and so, you know, building trust within your organization is a big way to be able to get from um, past systems to future systems, right? And this idea that, you know, if we can drive productivity, if we can drive efficiency, it's better for wages, it's better for the customer base, um, it's better for sales, and everybody wins. It's kind of a big part of um, all, all of those kind of things, right? And so um, integrating these systems from the front end to the back end of the restaurant, and it's, you know, and a lot of these things are transferable to retail and other systems um, is really, really key. Right. And so and what you see is that a lot of workers, particularly um, in blue collar industries, a lot of times in lower uh, income industries, haven't had the exposure to a lot of these technologies to be able to catch on really, really quickly sometimes. And so it's really important that like training is a part of of the, the whole feedback loop. Right. And so like particularly what we do at our restaurant is that we we're, we're big on getting people to believe in themselves and the ability to, to learn these technologies, right? And so if you can get people to have a sense of purpose, a sense of belief, then you're gonna have positive outcomes from that, right? And so a lot of these technological systems that um, businesses across the country are implementing also require us, you know, as business owners, as business operators to partner and develop people. 
And then as a result, you get that, um, that kind of multi-level uh, progression, right? So where you can get from hiring somebody to training them to then they realize that they have a career path higher earnings potential, right? A lot of these technologies reduces the physical demands of, of the jobs, um, which you know means they're healthier. Um, they can work on more hours if they want, they can work less hours if they need to, and it gives the business the flexibility to grow. Um, so I think that's really, really key takeaway. And yeah, that idea about where any local company, if you've got partners to help you, because these are big issues, right? But if you've got local partners and to the extent that public policy can make it easier for those partners to kind of come together to work on these things, that seems to be a key part of how you stay ahead of these massive digital changes within the workplace. Val, I'm curious within the context of what PRISM is doing in the healthcare industry, where any of that resonates. Well, it certainly does. Um, as you can imagine, we are a 24 seven business. And so that means that folks have to have access to learning wherever they are. And so we have a learning management system built by a wonderful team of digital uh, designers that make sure that folks have access to that learning um, specific to their job role, as well as anything that's required for annual competency and regulatory bodies. Um, they can access it using their phone, an iPad, a computer, and our entire business was um, disrupted by the pandemic. And um, even from offering in-person orientations, a lot of those things went digital. Um, applying online, you know, something that happened years ago, but you know, having to make sure that we could orient 150 plus folks every week. Um, we really relied on digital learning for folks to get to their mandatory safety training and for annual competencies. As you can imagine, clinical rotations are a huge part of what we do in our organization as a teaching and learning um, partner with our universities. And so simulation is a huge part of folks learning. And as you can imagine, when you're learning how to be part of a CPR um, heart attack response team, while you can hear um, the lecture about what to do, um, we are allowing people to actually be part of that event, be filmed while they're doing it, watch what they did well and where they might need to improve. You know, those are other ways using simulation that we can augment and ensure that folks are highly competent in their roles and record that. So, and the ability to integrate other um, external vendors, whether it's LinkedIn or any of our other regulatory partners, um, high school students that might need to have a virtual um, career event, um, those are all ways that we are using digital learning um, from supplies um, to our billing systems, um, even working in um, places where folks have to pull medications. You know, all of those things are done electronically and uh, we can't do that unless folks are eager to learn how to work digitally. We've had some folks to be able to work remotely. Some have um, flex working um, arrangements and some have gone completely remote. So uh, the pandemic just really helped us to be able to respond a whole lot more quickly than we thought we would be able to. So Val, you covered so much there where we have now digitized things. We've digitized the work itself. We digitized the record keeping, the work environment, the application process, the learning process, like so much of it there. And, and if you're somebody for whom you have not had access to that, that technology or the skills required to make use of it, it really puts you on the, on the outside in a lot of different ways. It really makes you vulnerable to what is a rapidly changing economy. Bridget, I'm curious in the context of what Opportunity Work has been doing, this idea of digital skills and digital upskilling, where that, where that figures into any of the stuff that you've been looking at. Yeah, so there, just listening to both Ryan and Val, thinking about how learning is something that is lifelong and continual. And so when you start to think about digital skills, one of the things that John mentioned was um, ask Sam, right? So a person has a device, they can go in and they can ask the questions and they can learn those things and those skills on their own. And I think we've oftentimes stuck ourselves in this place where you have to be sitting in a classroom to learn, or you have to be part of a webinar to learn. But the reality is with digital technology, you don't, you can learn everything every day, all day, there's asynchronous ways to learn. And so as we're talking to employers more and more, we're talking about learning and skilling as a lifelong, as something that can happen in real time versus it having to be so scripted 
where people have to go and sit. People can do those things on their own. And so I think with, uh, one of the things I've seen more than anything in this space for so long is being in a place where someone has started in a role and they've gotten stuck in that first job and there's been no additional skill building. There hasn't been no digital technology used to build those additional skills. And so that person gets to a 20 year impasse and they're just like stuck where do they go from there so even things from just like how you keep your skills sharp around interviewing or understanding the new technologies that people are using to interview those are the things we work with employers to understand to gain so we can then pass that information along to all of the training providers that are out here that are supporting people to the actual stars that are out here as well who are needing to make sure that they have the opportunity to move into to better roles and stars meaning those workers that are skill through an alternative route. Sorry about that. <laughs> S-T-A-R, star. S-T-A-R, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bridget. Yeah, and so obviously none of this happens unless companies are ready to make some of that investment in all of the workforce where these digital trends are having an impact. You know, and I, John and I talked a little bit about kind of what past trends of the private sector have been in terms of how they how they have traditionally thought about employer investment in their workers, and it's tended to focus on those who already have a degree or are or, or close to, to earning one. Um, I'm curious as I, how it is that you all are thinking about this issue of employer investment in workforce training and how you've seen things change. Val, let me, let me go to you because I mean, I know traditionally in healthcare, and this is true in the public policy sector as well, we spend, we spend a fair amount of training for nursing professionals and doctors and others at the professional ranks of the care economy, but we've never really done that much until recently for the skills and upskilling of the folks at the frontline care part of, of uh, the healthcare system. And we're starting to see some changes on that now, but I'm curious how Prisma is approaching that as an employer and where you see public policy needing to do a bit more of that as well. Well, I'm happy to report that for over 16 years, we partnered with Catalyst Learning to offer something here called School at Work. Uh, we work with our local um, school districts um, to help with skill building for folks that were trying to achieve their GED or their high school diploma. And once they achieve that um, particular credential, they're able to apply to post-secondary education. So some of the skills that they have been able to utilize while working and going to class one day a week are things like how they learn, time management, uh, communication skills, written both and oral, even computer skills. Um, folks um, did not have access to computers at home or the internet. And then learning about medical terminology, um, looking at other careers that they might be a good fit for and building their confidence. Now they're able to apply for stackable credentials, which could be things like a certified nursing uh, assistant certificate, EKG, phlebotomy, um, lab assistant, you know, those type things. Um, but when you invest in your employees to help them get the skills and build their confidence, that's where they begin to feel like they're able to go further. Um, because, you know, jumping right into a two-year forty degree can be very intimidating. And even actually going through the application process with a college can be intimidating, but utilizing a process such as that and some of our um, workforce development partners at this particular time, we're able to help people with the how-to. So remember, these are working adults and there are some times where um, they don't know how to look for resources within the community and bring those resources together to make it possible to go back to school. And as you can imagine in a healthcare system, the majority of our workers are women. And these are women that also have responsibility for their children. And so working with our partners, whether it be our SC Works, um, Department of Employment and Workforce, um, working with adult education, working with DSS, social services, you know, we're able to help folks get access to the resources that they need um, to get started. And then we can help them use their education assistance benefits to pursue um, additional training. Um, there's over 220 partners that we work with that also use an online option as well, so that it doesn't always mean that you're sitting in a classroom, that you can use an online option um, to gain some additional education. Um, but it does take some partnerships, um, some sector partnerships, some alignment with our hospital association, Department of Education, Commission on Higher Ed, Adult Ed, so that 
the person is not feeling as if they have to navigate all of that alone. And so those are some of the ways that we've worked with our entry level employees. We are expanding our apprenticeship models, working with our South Carolina Apprenticeship, apprenticeship Carolina, um, where they're able to learn and earn at the workplace. So they're not giving up um, their pay, um, but we're getting access um, to the funding for them to receive the training to cover tuition costs, book costs, and any fees so that that is not the barrier. And the wonderful thing that I like about some of the work that we've done with um, Business Leaders United is to lobby for the expansion of Pell Grants to cover short-term um, certificates and those types of things because most times that's where people begin to really believe in themselves and what they're capable of doing if we can help them get through that first step. Mm -hmm. Such excellent points, Val. And, and I really like how you lifted up the idea that even a large regional healthcare provider like Prisma still needs to have partners in the workforce development system and the higher ed system and the adult ed system to provide a range of support services as well as training and things like that so that your folks can succeed, but they, we need other partners to help Prisma achieve that. Chris, uh, uh, Ryan, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, given that um, you're a much smaller company than Prisma, right? But that partnership stuff is particularly important for you as well, right? In terms of where it is that you can, what you can do to invest in your employer and your employees and who else you need to be helping you do that at scale. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, even from kind of building on that point from a, a small business perspective, um, you start to realize um, systems are really important, right? So, um, you know, like a, a company like Walmart, the reason Walmart is a scale it's at is because of the systems that they have in place, right? To move that kind of product, that amount of product safely, mm -hmm. um, efficiently and productive, uh, produ productively requires tons and tons of systems, right? And, that sy and those systems allow you to train these employees to build the partnerships that, that are mutually beneficial for everybody. Um, and I think, you know, when we're talking about like training, um, and different areas like the size and scope of, of business. Um, systems are a really, really big thing. You know, So before I was uh, here, I used to work at Target in a, mo a multitude of operational roles. And you know, Target's a lot like Walmart in, that, in, in the sense that we have a lot of different systems. Everything is metric or um, you know, there's a lot of different um, redundancies that are in place. And when you come in, if you're, you know, an entrepreneurial background or mindset, you come into a new arena where you have to build, put in place the systems so that your employees can come in and thrive and succeed and be able to build out those partnerships. Um, so I think that's a, um, just a really important thing to add on as well. Yeah, absolutely. Bridget, I want to turn to you and I want to talk a little bit more about this concept of skills-based hiring. We talked to John a little bit about it, but this is an area where, that I know Opportunity Work has been doing a lot of work. Can you talk to us a bit more about kind of what skills-based hiring is and where it is that we can be promoting both with the private sector as well as with public policy to make it more of a way that we think about investing and advancing uh, workers? Yeah, so skills-based hiring is realizing that um, everyone in this country has the skills and those skills are not often needing to be attained through a four-year degree. And so when you start to think about skills within themselves, we think about, as I mentioned before, STARS, those are 70 plus million workers in this country who are skilled through an alternative route. And an alternative route can be a boot camp, it can be a workforce development training partner, it can be a community college, military service, all of those are additional ways that people build their skills. The primary way though that people build skills is on the job. And so when you even start to think about the things that we heard John talking about, people are building their skills in real time as they work. When you're thinking about an associate in the retail space, they're going into work every day thinking I'm, I'm ringing people's stuff up or I'm helping someone get through a line. But all of the technologies that they're using, all of the business essential or soft skills that people are using in that space, those are stackable skills that people are building. And sometimes they're not even realizing they're doing that. And so that's what skills-based is, is having an employer think about, I need to build a talent pipeline 
pipeline. And I need to build a talent pipeline regardless of where a person starts and regardless of what level of education they have. How do I make sure I'm building it? And so one of the things that John mentioned that I thought was fantastic was this evolution of work means you can either go build a whole new workforce or you can bring the people that are already in your business along the way. And so taking an associate, building them into a manager and helping them move into other higher levels of work and, and, and pay is exactly what the way businesses should be thinking. From a public policy standpoint, so we worked with the state of Maryland to uh, remove degree requirements from, the, from a lot of their jobs because there's this opportunity to be able to make sure that you don't leave jobs just open. Every time when a job stays open, that's an impact on, on us as a country. And when you start to think about certain types of jobs that stay open, like cyber, for instance, when you have tons of cyber jobs open, that's impacting our country. That's impacting the safety of where we are. It's impacting every resident in this country. And so when we worked with the state of Maryland to remove those degree requirements, they were at this place where they couldn't fill their talent pipelines because degrees were the proxy being used to determine whether or not a person has the skills to do the job. Once you lower that, that proxy, like you take that degree requirement out, you start to open up the bulk of people in this country who don't have a four-year degree. So there's there has to be an investment in making sure that businesses understand and can benefit from opening up their pipelines and not having um, the degree requirement on everything. When you think about federal government and the way that it operates, that is a big place where you have these government contractors who have very stringent requirements of hiring. And so they can't necessarily always reach out to the person with, with no four-year degree. That is, that's um, something that I always think is shameful for us as a country. When we have the federal government being one of the largest employers, you can open up so many opportunities to people by, um, uh, removing some of the stringent requirements and giving people the opportunity. The last thing I'll say is an individual, a star who has all the skills, they know they have skills. Right now, the degree um, requirement is even preventing them from being able to sit in front of an employer to just talk to them about the skills they have because they can't even get a foot in the door because they've already been screened out. And so really thinking in terms of opening up more pathways, bringing your staff along with you in the process, making sure everyone has some type of career growth plan when they're walking in the doors, recognizing the skills they have, whether you can see them right away or, or you can't, but giving the star their own agency over being able to determine too how their skills are being developed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is such, it's so, so many important points there. Um, not just what companies are doing, but to your point, Bridget, um, government agencies as employers, their employers too, they do need to change their practices on this and props to the state of Maryland that's done that and we need to get the feds and other states to do the same. But then also how is it that government policies can make it easier uh, to have uh, the private sector take a chance on somebody who doesn't have that degree but certainly has the right skills to do the job but might need some additional training to kind of fill in to make sure that they're achieving the certification or the other kinds of things that they're going to need to succeed in that job over time. I'm curious, uh, Val or Ryan, any thoughts you have about where it is that the government agencies, public policies could be doing more to make it easier for you to hire folks and help them advance even if they don't have a, a degree? Well, I'll add um, to Bridget's um, comments. You know, she was certainly speaking my love language. Um, <laughs> it, there are folks that have all the characteristics of being, they're already a stellar team member. Um, they're compassionate, they have a caring attitude. They may be working in environmental services and the patients feel so well taken care of when they come in the room. Uh, they have customer service skills. They just need the opportunity to go further. Um, it, it, we're one of those states where only 20% of the jobs require a four-year degree. And um, recognizing that and working with our high schools to help um, them understand that here are some certificates that we can help you to help students graduate high school with. 
Mm -hmm. um, one of the beauties of a youth apprenticeship is that students are dual enrolled in high school and in college at the same time in a technical college. They're completing their general education courses and prerequisites their junior and senior year. And by the time they finish, they have met all the requirements to keep going further into a nursing career. We can pretty much do that with several other roles that we have, whether it be pharmacy, whether it be diagnostic radiology, whether it be EMT, whether it be CMA, certified medical assisting, and just the opportunity to help our governmental partners and agencies connect the dots is huge. Mm -hmm. um, it's not an either or, it's an and. You know, in adult and for folks that need to achieve the GED, that's the space that you need to be in. And we will, you know, even if it's English as a second language, you know, that is how we help people to move forward. Strong articulation agreements between two and four year colleges, the agreement that here are the 71 um, subjects or that we have decided that we're gonna accept from each other so that folks don't have to retake these courses in order to keep going forward. Um, having those career discussions between the leader that they work with and how they see themselves over the next year or the next year or two or the second year or five year, building your leadership from the people that you already have. None of us can hire ourselves out of a workforce shortage. It takes loving and developing the people that you already have, it takes partnering with your two four-year and your high school um, partners to make sure that um, folks are developing that interest and seeing if that industry is a good fit for them while they're in school. And it takes working with our um, clients that may be out of work because their work went away because of the pandemic and they need to be reskilled, um, helping them to gain access to whether it is work keys or when, or helping them to understand how, based on your career assessment right now and the transferable skills that you've already built, that any of our organizations could be a great next step for you. And that's why we don't need to spend so much of our federal dollars in only funding two-year and four-year degrees. That's where earning some of those certificates can be helpful to those that need to start over to build that confidence to consider a, a different career field or how to move forward um, with a new career. And I, it just really does take a community effort to do that. Absolutely. Ryan, I'm gonna let you close us out here. Any final thoughts you have on any of the issues we've talked about this, uh, today? Yeah, I, I think in terms of just um, kind of the final question and kind of you know plugging a lot of these gaps, I think, uh, I think one area I think we really need to refocus on as a country is um, the gap that is created by um, poverty. Um, the, the, the lowest income spectrum of this country has some of the most untapped um, talent and potential because it's never invested in, right? And so it becomes this cycle of underinvestment in schools, which leads to a lack of business development, which leads to a lack of um, housing options, which leads to a lack of stability, which creates worse schools. And I think for local governments, they have to start there, right? They have to, you, some, you have to fix something, right? This can be, I, I can't speak for the rest of the country, but in the South, we have a major, major issue filling jobs related to fire, um, firefighters, um, anything public service related, sanitation workers. Um, these jobs can lift people out of poverty. Um, and they can give people the stability they need to recreate the economic fabric that recreates and creates, you know, strong schools and strong foundations and strong opportunities for people. And I think um, a lot of governments should use this opportunity um, where there's a dearth of workers or there's an inability to fill jobs to get creative with how you fill jobs, right? Um, and poor can mean, you, you know, you graduate from high school and you just don't have a job, right? You know, I think we, we tend to pigeonhole what poverty looks like. Poverty looks like a lot of different things in this country. It, it, it varies by region, by race, um, um, you know, and it spans, you know, the whole country. And so I think that's a big, big place where I think governments should really, really try and connect the dots, right? You have job openings, you have um, this economic gap, 
let's see what we can do to get a lot of these jobs filled, um, lift people out of poverty and give people more opportunity. Absolutely. If we're going to, to rebuild this country, make our community stronger, we have to invest in our people. And that includes the people that we have traditionally not been investing in for quite some time, right? Overcoming those barriers around poverty and race and other forms of exclusion. That's where government policy can start to turn the corner. And working with folks like yourselves in the private sector, working with organizations like Opportunity of Work, I know that we're going to to work to change that tide and uh, really change how it is we think about investing in people uh, in this country. And so I thank the three of you so much for being part of this conversation today. Bridget, Ryan, Val, thanks for joining me and looking forward to working on these issues with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks again to John, Bridget, Ryan, and Valerie for joining me today. Now, if you feel passionate about some of the things you heard today around digital upskilling, skills-based hiring and employer investments and training, and you want to see public policies that make it easier to bring these practices to more workers and companies throughout this country, then I want you to be part of this conversation as well. Go to National Skills Coalition's website at www.nationalskillscoalition.org and sign up to receive our email updates about how these policy issues are being addressed at the federal and state level by many of our network members. And if you are a business leader, Please join folks like Ryan and Valerie and become part of our Business Leaders United Network. You can form, find out more information at Blue's website, www.businessleadersunited.org. Thanks everyone. Please keep an eye out for information about our next Fireside Chat coming in August. Looking forward to seeing you then. <laughs>